I would say these first couple songs are two that you're not familiar with, and I was okay with that when I picked it, but I know that means that sometimes we resist the urge to uh, engage in new activities. And this first song is called uh, Yes I Will, and God gave me this song, I didn't write it, first of all, but uh, I, I came across this song during a very down season of my life, and worship, as you'll find out through the course of our time together, is very central to who I am as a human being. God has just gifted me with this love of worship, uh, and especially worshiping with other believers. And um, there was a time in my life where I was really down, and I came across this song. And the theme of this song is that I choose to praise God in the good times and the bad. That regardless of what I'm experiencing life today, whether it's a great day or it's a hard day, that God is still good, that he's still on his throne, that he's worthy to be praised. And so I can choose to engage in worship with him regardless of my own feelings uh, and that that is a good thing. So I'll teach it to you now. And then as we kind of get part way through, I'd invite you to start singing along with us. And this song's called Yes, I Will.
This next song is called Christ Be Magnified. You know, the scripture talks about that even the rocks and the earth cry out to the glory of our Creator. How magnificent He is. And the Bible says that one day every, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. But in the meantime, it's up to us, the church, to carry that message. That Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came and lived a human life. He gave up that life through a brutal death, crucifixion on the cross, was laid in the ground, and rose on the third day. And that resurrection of Jesus Christ, it gives us hope for this life and for all eternity. But this world is a dark and scary place. And Jesus needs to be shared. The light and love of Jesus needs to be shared throughout. And this song talks about our responsibility as followers of Jesus. That people would look at us, they'd look at our actions and our deeds, and they would see Jesus Christ. Not just meagerly, but they would see him magnified. They would see him more clearly through us than through anything else. And so this song, if anything, is a prayer that Christ would be magnified through us. Every creature finds its inmost enemy. 
I'm going to call our, uh, our ushers in right now. They're going to take our offering. I should have a seat as they do that. Father God, we worship you this morning. We give you all honor and glory and praise. And our prayer this morning is that as the world looks at us, it would see you more clearly, better defined, that our actions, our words, our deeds, they would represent you and all your glory. That you are just, that you are merciful, that you are truth, and you are grace. We worship you this morning in the mighty name of Jesus Christ and all God's people said. Amen. doing today who do we have here from Arizona put up your hand one two Arizona you're here every week you come all the way from Arizona Poppy who else is anybody else from Arizona just you Adeline you too welcome guys thanks so much for Emerson's here awesome so today we're going to talk a little bit about how God provides for us and God provides one of the most favorite things in my, in my opinion, is food. We're going to talk a little bit about how God provides us with food. And so today I brought some of my favorite food. Who wants to come and help me take it out of the bag? All right, come on up. Line up because i got a few different things. Put your hand in here and pull out something. And we're going to talk a little bit, one at a time. Go ahead. Jada? Okay, hold it up for everybody to see. This is Jody's favorite potato chip. It says sea salt and malt vinegar. Oh, yeah. Yum. Who likes chips? Oh. Right? Right? Nobody doesn't like chips. Okay. Thank you. Next one. How about you, little fella? You want to go and put your hand in there and grab something next? Corn chips? Those are good, too. Oh. Okay. So, you know how we always like candy and chips and everything? But my favorite fruit is my banana. Who likes bananas? Oh, bananas. Okay, so I just put that in there to pretend that I'm actually healthy. You don't like bananas? Some people don't like it. That's fair. Poppy, you're next. No, not your thing. Okay, does anybody know what's in here? Peanuts. Maybe sometimes this one's almonds, actually. Now, I've got a little secret to tell you guys. So I pretend I take these to work. I Everybody thinks I'm just eating almonds. I'm going to open it up. I'm going to show you what's inside. Chocolate covered almonds. <laughs> cheater, cheater, chocolate almonds. Does those not? We're gonna have a special snack afterwards, okay, Poppy? Not right now, okay? Because this is mine. I don't share. <laughs> okay, sometimes I share. Okay, you're next. Pull out the next item. What do we have here? I bet you guys are gonna like this one. All right, so. <coughs> Whose favorite chocolate bar was this one, ladies and gentlemen? Everybody? It was also Pastor Terry's favorite. He liked Kit Kat Chunk, didn't he? Kit Kats. Kit Kats are really good. Okay, Benson's going to grab the last item. What do we got, Benson? It's a big one. Oh, yeah. Licorice. Red 
licorice, it's cherry licorice. Who likes licorice? Put up your hand. Right? Your dad loves those? I'm not sharing with your dad either. Okay, so listen up guys. We've got a big crowd today. And you know what? I just want to say something. God provides all of our needs, doesn't he? Doesn't matter if it's goodies or bananas or apples. He takes care of us, doesn't he? God's pretty good. So what we're going to do today is we're going to head back to Junior Church and we're going to do a little craft. We're going to do a little song. We're going to do a little dance. We're going to have fun. So um, I'm going to get Jada and Poppy because you know where we're going. You're going to lead the pack. And oh, Lexi's back there. And Liam, you guys show where all oh, our new, new visitors to where we have to go, okay? On your mark, get set. Let's go to Junior Church. Thanks, Joey. All right, so we're going to take a minute and greet one another. And so what we're going to do, everybody stand to your feet. Stretch up your crick in your back. I want you to find somebody in the room that you did not come here with today. And in light of Jody's lesson, I want you to ask them, what was the best thing they ate over the holiday weekend last week? What was it? Find somebody that you didn't come with today. Go ask them that question. What, what did you eat? over the long weekend that you loved? What was the best thing you ate? Go ask them that question. some time this morning and talk about worship, which is often on my mind, as you know, we just experience together. It's something that I love to do. I love, uh, it seems like y'all love it as well. Y'all, that's a word I didn't have when I moved away from British Columbia 11 years ago. It's joined my vocabulary, y'all. We use that a lot uh, in Arizona. And so, I've been think but I've been thinking about worship, and, and I recently had, had a chance to talk to my own church 
uh, and preach on this subject and kind of share my heart behind it. And one of the things that kind of got me going was just seeing churches in this season, in this era, that it seemed like worship had been misaligned. And maybe you've witnessed this yourself. And what I've seen is kind of worship veer off the tracks from what I think is maybe God's intended design for the church. And one of the things that stood out was that in some churches, worship has really become a performance. It's something you observe from afar as a spectator. And yet in other churches, it seemed almost like maybe it was forgotten. Uh, or in others yet, maybe much worse is that it was neglected. Uh, and, and for many, it, it was through no fault. You know, just the course of events, things slowly got to where they're at. But it got me thinking about worship. What is it? What is, what is worship for the church? What is it there for? How do we do it? Why do we do it? What's my role if we're going to have all these things? And so I want to unpack some of those questions here this morning. And, and so if we're going to start off on that subject, I think the first thing we might want to do that would be useful to us here is to establish a definition of worship for us as a church. And so uh, the first thing I did when I was thinking about establishing a, de a definition was I, I just opened the dictionary, or rather we don't use paper dictionaries, I'm a millennial, we, we, we go to dictionary.com and we just type in the word. And so I came up with this, do we have slides there? Oh, he's running, sorry. I just pulled up the dictionary definition of worship. And the first point says this, reverence offered a divine being or supernatural power. We don't have them? That's all right. No worries. So there's three points under the definition of worship. Reverence offered a divine being or supernatural power. And I thought, well, that, that kind of makes sense. Also, an act. So you could have kind of the noun or the verb of offering reverence to a divine, the divine, to God, right? The second point said, it could also be a form of religious practice with its creed and ritual. You know, we think of liturgy, we think of, you know, going through a certain set of steps, reciting, uh, and so, and I thought when I looked at those first two, that right out of the gate, well, if you kind of took some combination of that, that we were expressing reverence to God and that we did, through, did so through this, you know, uh, routine, you know, maybe we meet in the same place at the same time, and we do the same kinds of things, and they're directed towards God, that, that those first two points almost, almost started to build the definition that I was looking for for us, uh, you know, in the church already. But then the third point kind of got me thinking, because it says extravagant respect or admiration for or devotion to an object of esteem. And it got me thinking about that maybe we could direct that reverence or that attention or that affection towards something other than the divine, right? This is saying an object. It could be a person. It could be a, a thing. It could be an idea or ideal that we might worship or revere something other than the divine. And it just reminded me of this truth that we as human beings were built for worship. That truly that we fall into one of those two categories, but in either case, we are always worshiping. We always revere or esteem in one direction or another. And the choice that, that falls on us is where do we direct that attention? Do we direct it towards the divine? Or do we focus all of our energy and time and attention do we revere something other than God? And that's just human nature. And we see this going back as far as the beginning of scripture. When we open the, the Bible, and we, we go to Genesis chapter one, right there, I and mean, we see God created, he speaks the cosmos into existence. And then he, it, it, it talks about how he created us, how he created human beings. And what the scripture tells us is that God created us in his image, in his likeness. That we have attributes imbued to us that no other created thing has. We have features about us that are like God. 
and nothing else created has that. And especially when you start to consider, well, we have self-awareness and consciousness, we have free will, thus we have truly the capacity to worship and to worship in whatever direction that we choose. That's our design, that's our nature. But the thing about worship is we can't just turn it off. It's happening. And so there is no status quo. You're either, put, you're either moving towards God or you're moving away from God. We just can't not worship. It's who we are. And so then when I started to think of that definition of worship, I thought, well, maybe it's, maybe it's that expression, right? If we are worshiping, maybe if we're trying to build a, you know, just put a little label on it that might help us to get a little bit better at following Jesus through how we worship, that we might say in our definition that worship is our expression to God. It's how we express ourselves. That's, that's our worship. Worship is us expressing ourselves to God. And so that was kind of the definition that I came up with, and I mean, we'll see how well that holds up over time, but I felt like it served pretty well. And so I want to kind of start from that, that point. That's our launching point this morning. Worship is our expression to God. And if, if we want to claim that as true, if we want to say, okay, this is where we're working from. If worship is our expression to God, then I think the next question is, how do we do that? One of the things I was thinking of surrounding this idea of expression is I, I had heard this analogy, and I didn't come up with this myself, but I heard this, this, uh, this metaphor of, imagine you're taken into an art studio, like a, a, not just the gallery where the paintings are done, but it's the studio, and there's the master painter. You know, he's a, he's a Da Vinci, he's a Van Gogh, he's a person who can paint, I mean, to the most masterful level. And even people who don't understand art, or maybe aren't moved by art, would look at, look at his paintings and, and, you know, grown men move to tears, even though they're not even art connoisseurs. So imagine you're invited into this art studio, you're looking at this art, it's stuff you've never seen before, and it's, it's stirring up in you emotions that you didn't even know you had. You're just looking at this, this beauty beyond worth. And the master painter takes you on a little, little tour of his studio and, and he shows you all the paintings. And at the end of the tour, he sits you down with your own easel with a blank canvas on us and he gives you all the paint, you know, all the colors and the brushes. And you're just overwhelmed with emotion because you're in the presence of immeasurable worth you know, indescribable beauty. And it's just overwhelming your senses just looking at it. And he says, well, just paint, right? Just paint what you're feeling. What is it that's going through your head? Like, when you look at that one, what do you think of? And so, you know, you start to paint. And maybe, maybe your painting is a little bit like mine, where it kind of looks like a stick man, you know, in very basic red or whatever, or blue, you know, it's like, I'm, I'm not an artist in that sense, I'm not a painter. Maybe you're a little bit like I am in that sense, but, but you just start painting, because it's like, well, this is what I see, this is what I feel, and you're just kind of doing the best you can. And the master painter looks at you and goes, oh, wow, that's incredible. I love that color you chose. Oh, I, I didn't even look at it that, oh, man. And then the master starts to appreciate your appreciation of his incredible works. And then he's interpreting what you're doing and you just keep going, you realize he's just so happy to see you engaged with what he's created. I think our worship, when we talk about that expression to God, it's a lot like that. That we're in the presence of incredible beauty. I mean, look at the mountains, right? We were out by the lake a couple nights ago, just walking, watching the sun go down over the hills. I mean, you're in the presence of incredible beauty. It's immeasurable worth. I've had the great pleasure of watching, you know, our kids play with their cousins over the last couple weeks. It's like I'm stirred to emotion that I forgot I had because there's so much life and optimism for the future. They haven't, you know, children 
you know, Lord willing, haven't experienced the heartache or the letdowns in life that we have. And so they just walk through life with this joy, that heart of a child. And for me, I'm moved to express myself in those moments. And each of us is in some capacity or another. But we can't withhold that expression and we don't want to misapply it. We don't want to uh, put it in the wrong direction. But of course, in that illustration, the master painter is God and the, and the student is us. And that we're given an opportunity to express ourselves, and the quality of our expression matters less than the sincerity and the direction in which we're expressing ourselves. And so think about that with expression. But then, like I asked before, that question of, well, how do we, how do we channel it? How do we express ourselves? What's the appropriate medium? Is it painting? What is it? And I think there's many great answers that are often correct and good. But one of the things that I saw from the early church, and I'm going to read from Colossians, is that we get to see, and it's the beauty of our faith, right? Is that we can look at the scriptures and see the New Testament, and we get to see so many incredible details of what the first followers of Jesus did at the foundations of our faith. People who walked with Jesus, men who knew him face to face, taught us how we should do some of these things. They, and they described in detail what was done before us so that we would have good examples of what to do. And so the Apostle Paul writes in the book of Colossians, he says, this is uh, chapter 3, verse 15 through 17, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts since as members of one body you were called to peace and be thankful let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms and hymns and songs from the spirit singing to God with gratitude in your hearts and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. That middle section, let the message of Christ, the message of Christ, the gospel, the good news, that the Son of God came and lived as a human being like we did and gave up his life on a cross and then resurrected from a grave after he was put to death. And then he's alive today. That gospel, that good news. Let it dwell among you richly. Let it be the focus. Let it be the thing which stirs you up. Let it be that motivator that you, meet, that you, that you need in life. Don't forget that Jesus Christ came and lived and died and rose again. This is important. Let that message stir you up and help you to follow Jesus better. As you teach and admonish, you correct one another and encourage one another with wisdom through psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit, singing to God. That you would do these things, that you would let the, the message of Christ dwell among you, that you would teach and, and correct and encourage and build each other up. How? Just sing songs together. This is a great mechanism. And so we see right here, from the foundations of our faith, right there in the first century, one of the very first churches, that they were doing this, what we just did here for a couple minutes. That they met together, that Jesus was the focus and the center of their attention, and that they sang songs. And they let that move them to be better followers of Jesus each time they met. And I thought that was really encouraging because here we are, a couple millennia later, and we still do this. Churches across the globe still do this in their own ways. And so we see music as a valuable tool. And so we think to ourselves, okay, well we, worship is us expressing ourselves to God, and that we can do this through music. This is a valuable tool that we see the early church use. This is good for us.
And then the question you might ask yourself then is, can't I do this on my own? Right? Can't I focus on Jesus and just sing a song in my bedroom? Can't I just turn on the radio while I drive down the road? Isn't, isn't that fine? And my first answer to that is, of course, yes, that's fine and good. I think a lot about private spiritual disciplines, things we do on our own, how we build into ourselves, how we remind ourselves in private and solitude. Okay, this is who Jesus is. This is what he means to me. This is how I follow him better. These are good things. There's so many private spiritual disciplines that are good things. You know, we have prayer, fasting, you know, acts of generosity, often done in private. And the Bible describes, you know, we look at the New Testament, there's often lots of descriptions of do these kinds of things where no one can see them. It's between you and God. And worship, it's not excluded from that bucket, but we take that one step further and we add that next layer where we also do it together, publicly, corporately, as an act of communion with other believers. It's not an either or equation, it's a both hand. We worship in private, we worship in public. One of the things I thought about as I was kind of ruminating on private versus public and, and where it all fits, was the importance of gathering together and how I had experienced in recent history an unprecedented event that prevented me from gathering with other believers and worshiping corporately for an extended period of time. You know, the lockdowns of the pandemic kind of put us in this, oh, we didn't know we'd never, you know, have access to this for any period of time. And I think a lot of believers started to remember over that season that while the private is good, there's no replacing this public gathering and meeting together. There's something special and unique about it that's important to our faith. And I, you know, I can think in that season of, you know, several times I sat on the foot of my bed with my guitar I remember one time in particular when I was learning that song we just sang, Christ Be Magnified, and just sitting there singing that out with the bedroom door closed, and I think Ellie and the kids were out, and I was just worshiping by myself. And it was great. But it's not the same as when I get together with a whole group of people who profess to follow Jesus, and we sing that song together. And I hear the chorus of voices, and I realize this unity of spirit and purpose there is something profoundly powerful about that that we need to lean into, and it's important for our faith. And of course, we see this in the book of Hebrews. The author of Hebrews writes and kind of leans into the church a little bit and says to them in chapter 10, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. He was correcting them, saying, hey, don't forget, you need to be together. Like, that should be a habit in your life. That should be a routine. It should be something you do regularly. And I thought of that in combination with this idea of worship, and it's like, well, this is something I can't do in my bedroom alone. I, I don't sing with other believers. I'm by myself. And I need to be with the others. We need to worship together. And I'm not going to read from 1 Corinthians this morning, but there's a whole chapter, chapter 14. Paul talks a lot about conduct in these gathering type settings. And one of the things that just pops off the page, he says it again and again and again, that as we meet together, as we do these things, as we worship, that it builds up the church. And so I would say, if we're going, what is worship? It's our expression. How do we do it? Well, we can use music. Why do we worship? There's a couple reasons in there. And one of the biggest ones is that it builds up the church. 
God honoring worship builds up the church. We need it, much like those private disciplines, it grows our spiritual and our personal faith, but also it builds us collectively as a group, a group on mission, a group called to go and to love the lost and the hurting, to spread the gospel, to make disciples of all nations, to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And we have a common mission in our faith. We're not just here for the goody-goody, pat each other on the back club and make each other feel good. We also have a purpose and a calling. And every church embodies that and carries that out in their own unique way as God instructs them. But we need to be encouraged. And like we saw in that passage in, in Colossians, we need to be corrected. And for all these things to happen, we need to be together. And so it's just a cycle. You feed in, you, you go through the process, and then you do it again and again and again. And there is no arriving, my friends. You never truly get there. You just keep doing it until the Lord calls you home. When I was a little boy, um, I had several people come up to me. Uh, and, I, and I was pretty little, you know, about the age of my own sons now, someone in there. One of them was a woman at the back of the room who had said to me, hey, Dad, you know, the Lord told me you're going to be a pastor one day. Hey, Dan, you're going to lead in the church one day. Hey, Dan, you're going to be a shepherd of, the, of a flock one day. God has called you to lead in the church. And I was just a little boy. I mean, I don't know what to do with this. I just nod. Okay, that sounds great. I wonder what that looks like. I wonder what that means. I didn't know what to do with it at the time. And so a lot like Mary, I just kind of treasured it in my heart, knowing God's got a plan for my life. That was my big takeaway from these prophetic experiences that I, that I had. And I think with a lot of things of that nature, you, you end up just kind of, it's always a wait and see. Well, okay. But I always trusted in the Lord that he would, you know, bring me down the path that he had for me. And so several people unconnected came to me at different points in my childhood giving me this message of my you know my leadership my calling in the church as a little boy i used to sing in the church christmas and easter plays and love those you know doing all that thing it's so important that we account for our children as a church collectively that we include them and and, and bring them up as scripture instructs us. But I got to sing and then uh, as I went into middle school, I started playing drums like my, like my dad and we had this, this very drum set would sit in our, you know, in our rec room upstairs and God bless my mom, she never seemed to care. We would just bang away and we're learning to play drums. I played drums in middle school, did the marching band and the you know, jazz band and all that stuff. I love playing drums. I did even more in high school, I went on to do musical theater and singing, and all the while God just fostering in me this love of music as this expressionary tool that I could express myself in ways through a song that, that it, you know, words never seemed to convey. There was no other medium that seemed to be able to get the point across in the same way as music. And I got to do all those things, but one of the things that really stood out about high school was that was the season where I started engaging with our church youth group worship band. And so I, I, I remember going and auditioning for the church high school worship band. I remember them looking at me at the end of my audition and going, hey, you're not quite good enough yet. You need to practice some more. And I remember going and practicing. And later on that year, I, you know, I advanced enough that said, yeah, you, why don't you come play on the team? And I did that. And I remember, for me, high school worship team was... And that was a highlight. Every Friday night, we'd go to the church. And I remember God giving me opportunities in high school to, to represent my faith in Jesus to my peers. And because of this foundation I had in the church, that I often made a decision to represent Jesus well. And I don't know if you know this about teenagers, but they often have adult level decisions to make 
but they don't have adult-sized experience with which to make these decisions. And so having something like a, a great youth group and, and good leaders and, and, and a solid family life that's all rooted in Jesus Christ, founded in the church, you know, that gives you a much greater advantage in navigating those channels in a way that puts you on a, one trajectory for life where you might have been on a, on a less positive one otherwise. But I remember going and playing drums and making sawdust out of my drumsticks at the back there. and It was a noise. I, I think it was a joyful noise. I don't know if it was a pretty noise, uh, but we made noise for Jesus. And I just remember, you know, my little bleeding teenage heart just pouring it out for Jesus in worship. And then going back to school on Monday and going, okay, I can do this. I can live for Jesus today. Those experiences, they, you know, they like recharged my battery. They, they refreshed me in a way that I was suddenly able to live out my faith where maybe without that encouragement, without that infusion, I might not have been able to, to do that quite as well. As I graduated high school, I remember I started to mentor some of the younger kids and teach them some of the same skills that I had learned. I mean, I'm only two, three steps ahead of them, but somebody's got to teach them, and I remember the guys who taught me, and so I would do the same thing. Teach them how to, how to get better at their, at their instrument, how to lead worship. And then God put me uh, in a church position where I started leading out from the front of the stage, started singing and leading. And it was around that time that I met Ellie, and we got married, and uh, we started doing that together. And much like this morning, it, for us, it's often been a family affair. You know, who, who plays what in the house? Okay, well, you get to play bass today, and you're going to play guitar, and oh, you do sound, because somebody's got to do that. And we did all those things. But for the last 15 years, Ellie and I have been side by side, leading worship like this at churches, as God called us from one place to another, just like you, like you saw here this morning. And, you know, our intention is to do that for many, many years to come. Because what we've seen is the same thing that I experienced as a teenager, it's the same thing I experience today, it's that when we gather together and we worship together, each of us finds that little piece of encouragement to pull through the next week. And some weeks you come in really low, and it brings you from really low to, I can get through this. Other weeks you come in and it's miraculously transformative. You go from one place to, I'm ready, God, send me. But in any case, we come together, we be the church, and we express ourselves in unity to Jesus. And the Holy Spirit rests here among us, and he ministers to our soul because our attention, our affection, our reverence, our whole being is just about Jesus in that moment, and we're doing it together. When we gather in his name, there he will be among us also. So that's a little bit about my story. And I thought that might be a good point to kind of talk about, well, what about the rest of us? If this is the path I'm on, what's your path this morning? What's your role in worship? If it's our expression to God, and that maybe as a church we say, well, we're going to use music. This is a good medium for us. Some churches have a whole bunch of other mediums. They've got painters or flags or all sorts of things. But, you know, it's like, pick a lane. Let's do this thing. Let's do it together. Let's make it about Jesus. What's your role in that? And as I was thinking and kind of pondering this question, what came to mind was the image of a rowing team. I don't know if you've ever watched any rowing on TV, and like, don't get any ideas, I'm not even mildly athletic, so it's like, I'm not a rower, but, you know, you've seen these guys, right? They get in those really sleek looking boats, and they're all, you know, they're moving in unison. You got that one guy at the head, stroke, 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 and they're just, I mean, they're just powerhouses. And you see these boats with no motors, just flying up the water. And what I thought about was maybe as we gather for a church service, 
So we get here together on a Sunday and we go, well, we're going to worship together. Maybe, maybe we're a little bit like a rowing team. Because you could imagine if that was us, if, if us rowing down the water was us moving further and faster into the presence of God, acknowledging Him with more power and authority, and being able to experience His healing power, His ministry, His correction, His encouragement, and what we give each other, how well would we do if when we got in the boat, only half of us rode? Maybe there's only a few people rowing. How quickly, how powerfully does that boat move compared to the next team where everyone's moving in the same direction with the same focus and vision, but they're completely in unison with how they do it. They're united in purpose and attention. One team's gonna go a lot further and a lot faster. Or even think of it this way, all the teams are at the shore and they're loading up in their boats. And they get in their boats, they're pushing out. And we look around and we realize, oh gosh, there's only two people in the boat, where's the rest of the team? Ah, well, they couldn't make it today. Oh, they slept in. Oh, they had, a, they had a long week. Well, they're out camping, they're out hunting, they're out fishing, you know. We gotta get in the boat, too. So I saw a couple of those, and so, when I started to unpack this question of, well, what is my role? What is your role? I thought the first, the first and most obvious to me was that we all need to participate. Participation matters. We all need to be there to get in the boat, and then we all need to try and row in unison. Participate together. And so in this context, it means, oh, well, first I come to church, you know, regularly, and there are weeks you're not here. That's normal, that's part of life. Nobody needs to do 52 Sundays a year. Don't hear that from me, there's no condemnation. But it, is it a part, is it a priority for you? Is it, is it a habit in your life that church is part of what you do, it's who you are, that you regularly gather with unbeliever, or with, with other believers to worship? Is that something that's a priority for you? Because if it's not, you might wanna consider that. And then the next step to that is that when you get here, how do you participate? Are you engaged with the process? Do you, do you stand when the others stand? Do you, are you united in physical posture? <coughs> and some of us, health prevents standing all the time. Again, no condemnation. I'm not saying, oh, you have to stand if you can't physically stand. But I'm just saying, like, from a from a, you know, a posture of your heart, for many of us, just the physical posture might be the first step because we're not, we haven't even taken the care to do that. Or maybe you don't sing along. Oh, I don't really like this song. Well, it's not about the song, it's about Jesus. It's, I just told you, we're here to build up the church. Let's do that together. Because the song's just kind of the rudder for us. It's just reminding us what our attention's about, that we make it about Jesus. Maybe you clap. Maybe sometimes you, you raise a hand in an act of surrender because that expression that's within you is just, it needs that extra bit of physical engagement. And there's some, there's some level of the spiritual and the physical, there's a lot of overlap there that we can't always describe, but they interact with one another and how we present ourselves physically to the king of the universe in our worship, that matters. So we got participation. Engage, be here, and then participate with it. The other application I thought of, and this is generally speaking only for, just for a few in any church congregation, but it's to contribute. Some of us have these, these gifts in music or, or technology. You, you know, you're, you've got the capacity to contribute to making this experience happen. And in a small church like this, every person who has a gift like that, who can contribute, matters. It's the difference between it happening or not happening. It's happening this morning just because we happen to be in town. Otherwise, it would probably be a week off, sounded by what Crystal was telling me. 
if you've got the gift, bring it. Give it to the Lord. Don't withhold your gift. Contribute it to the church. That's part of your expression. And those of us who have those gifts and have done that regularly, we understand. And we all have to regulate life and the things that are going on. But if you've got that niggle from the Holy Spirit in the back of your, your mind there, don't ignore it. Ask God, what is my role? When you pray that in earnest, you'll get an answer. Might not always be the one you want, but you'll get an answer. And the last one I thought of in terms of worship, what is my role? Is it to participate? Is it to contribute? I think for all of us, it's also to, uh, to invite. Yeah, you guys can come on up. Some of us, you know, we look at that passage I referenced in 1 Corinthians 14. That, uh, that Paul's talking about build up the church, build up the church. When you gather together, make sure your worship is orderly, you build up the church. And the, one of the last things he says is also so that the unbelievers among you might witness what you're doing, the actions that you're taking to engage with the God of the universe, and that they might be convicted and come to know Jesus just by watching you interact with one another corporately as a church. So that truly our acts of worship that we engage, when we engage here together, that they're a witness to the outsiders, to the unbelievers, those who don't yet know Jesus. And so some of us are in this position where we know somebody, we're in a relationship with them, we're, we're leading them and guiding them, and maybe our next act, our role in worship is to invite someone to come with us and to witness and to experience and just to see what God does with that. I think in a lot of cases it's, you know, it's a timing thing. It's not like you don't have to be running around on the street grabbing every other person. But I think a lot of times we're in relationship with unbelievers and we're given an opportunity to witness to them. And you can bring them here. And if the worship is engaging with God, if it's honoring to Him, then God works through those moments and you'd be amazed. It's, it's often not the thing you think it is that helps someone come to know Him. And so what's your role in worship? Well, for all of us, it's to participate. For some of us, it's to contribute. And at the right time, generally for most of us, it's to invite someone to come and experience it with us. The church is called to do great things, to spread the gospel. Like I said, we've got this mission. And we need fuel. We need encouragement. We need connection. Because it's a long, long, hard road. And we weren't meant to go it alone. We were designed to do this in relationship. We were designed to do it in community. The church is not a solo sport. It's a rowing team. There's a whole group of us. And we're moving that boat on down the river. And so I'd invite you to stand. I'm going to pray for us. And uh, we're uh, going to spend some time practicing that participation. And I'll say this again. If physically you need to sit at some point, like that's just, that's what your body's saying. Oh, I just can't stand that. Don't feel any pressure from me. But uh, let's engage together. I think these uh, next couple ones, everyone will know. And uh, we'll worship a little bit more. Father God, we give you our time, we give you our attention, and our attention. We thank you that we can be here as a church and worship and know you. May you just move among us now as we worship some more. Let us know you and experience you. Let us be encouraged. The hardships that we face in life right now, the challenges, the difficulties. God, would you just remind us how great you are, how mighty you are. That the very breath in our lungs that you put it there for the express purpose of not acknowledging you. Encourage us this morning. Draw us close to you in Jesus' name. Amen.
greatness this morning. We honor you in our songs of praise. We give you all glory and honor. And we thank you, Jesus, that you came and died for us and rose again. We give you all honor and glory in everyone's life. Amen. Amen. Well, have a fantastic rest of your day. Thank you so much, everybody.